There's three generations of this saw and two generations of the Delta. The original generation of the DeWalt was made, uh, I believe it was in Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, it was then packaged up and sent to uh, Canada, where it was made there for a number of years. And then, uh, in a cost-saving measure, they packed it up and sent it to China. Apparently, the, the engineering group that did that, uh, each time you do this thing, you usually have to develop a new set of molds to make a lot of the parts because you can't afford to shut down your whole factory while you're moving, uh, moving this thing. So usually they, they take an extra, take and create an extra set of molds. When they did that in China, the bolts that, that hold the, uh, the yoke for the table tilt, uh, they didn't get those located properly in the table and they took a huge amount of abuse. Uh, probably the first several thousand saws that they made, uh, they had to wind up replacing either the whole table or they lost the sale altogether. But uh, their, the DeWalt name really went downhill as a result of that. Okay, then uh, when uh, Delta DeWalt Porter Cable had a, had a breakup as a result of uh, transferring to Stanley, um, they, the whole unit was spun off. Uh, DeWalt decided they weren't going to manufacture the scroll saw anymore, so it went with uh, Delta. Delta decided that they were going to carry on with the scroll saw. So what they did is they took this saw, <laughs> put gray covers on it, changed the part numbers of the covers only, and came out with the, uh, the gray Delta saw, which has got all the same internal parts here. Uh, they did that in preparation, it was a marketing move, prior to releasing a whole new generation of saw, which was significantly cost reduced. It is not as good a machine as this. Okay, any, anybody know how to work on one of these things? <laughs> that, that's a vicious rumor. <laughs> All right. Uh, First off, what I wanted to do is uh, take a minute and show you some of the motions of these things and then show you how it gets those motions. What I've done here, while the uh, audience wasn't looking, we uh, did a little magic trick and I just dropped all the parts here. Like yeah. So we get an opportunity to see what's moving inside there. And this looks like, you know, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory or some such thing. But anyway, the, uh, the method by which you get the, um, the front rocker arms moving is with these connecting rods, one here and one here that's enclosed in this uh, cover that doesn't come apart. That transfer of energy comes from this rocker assembly back here which is driven by a connecting rod, and it looks just like a miniature connecting rod, maybe from a model airplane engine or something like that. And the, we've got an eccentric on the end of a motor shaft. So the, it means it doesn't, uh, it doesn't turn in the center. It's offset. Let's see if I can get the, yeah, get that cord back out of the way there so you can see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I mean, you can stand on those. Right, right. I was thinking of that earlier today. Yeah, as long as you can reach it. But anyway, the, uh, <coughs> this eccentric mounts to the motor shaft, which makes this uh, behave much like a connecting, I mean, a, a <coughs> crankshaft. So when that thing goes around, there's a little bit of motion that, it, that this connecting rod imparts where it pulls this rocker, which causes this whole assembly to rock back and forth. The, uh, the eccentric there also has a small counterweight on it. Anytime you involve a, an eccentric like that, you're gonna get a lot of vibration. They put a counterweight in there to offset the vibration. So that, uh, DeWalt was right proud of themselves. Most of the other, or a lot of the other scroll saws 
you know, particularly the older uh, DeWalt, uh, I mean uh, Delta pin scroller, it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of vibration related with that. So anyway, the idea is they move this, the shaft back and forth, or this, this uh, linkage, and cause these rockers front and rear to move up and down. And something I'll show you when I get to the pictures is down inside of here, there's a bellows that all its purpose is is to squirt a little air out of there. So it takes advantage of that motion going up and down to operate a bellows to squirt a little air out of there to blow dust out of your way. So then armed with, uh, armed with all that, now you get to see what moves. Also contained in here is a circuit board, which is the controller for the DC motor that's here. And there's a potentiometer hooked to this uh, speed controller on the, on the switch head. And those come down those wires. Uh, for anybody who might get brave enough to dive into one of these things, um, if you're interested, I've taken pictures of all of these things. You'll see a lot of them tonight. Uh, but anyway, that is that is the one thing that's a little bit intimidating because a lot of the connectors are alike, so you got to have a pretty good idea where those uh, where those wires go back once you <laughs> once you get this assembly off of here and you got to disconnect all the wires. This here? This here? Oh no! This. Off, he, he, he can't do what he just did. Yeah. This this whole thing here is is one assembly. You can take it loose from here, so you'll now have this this whole thing off in an assembly. You disconnect it up here, in this region. You can take that front rocker assembly off. I'll show you pictures of that shortly, and if we have time, we'll uh, break into it a bit. But anyway, this, this thing does not come apart. It, it does dismount from the saw. You take uh, four screws loose from here and disconnect this, this linkage that's going through this arm. And you can pull this part off. You can, so you can basically depopulate what's in here. Uh, another thing to take note of while we've got it in this form, a lot of... Uh, a lot of people have exercised a lot of words about this, um, this shaft here, or this rod that goes through the upper arm. Move, move the switch plate to the back. Yep. When you turn that uh, blade tensioner lever, what it does, it pulls on, on the end of this rod. When you do so, that pulls on this wedge back here, and all that does is it raises the arm. And I've got the I've got the blade tensioned here. At any rate, you can you can see that wedge moving back and forth on that rod. It rides against this plate here, and that's what that's what controls the, the height of this arm and the tension of the blade. Go ahead and move that again so I'm, I'm pull this on the back. Okay. Yeah, yeah you, you can adjust the, the amount of travel of that arm by, by rotating this. It requires a little bit of uh, planning ahead here to you know, raise this rocker assembly up as high as it'll go so you've got clearance to, to rotate that that uh, portion of the arm. Okay, let's uh, dive into some pictures here of the insides of one of these things. All right, what I'm showing here is the um, center pivot for that rear rocker assembly. As it turns out, this thing here is the one that gets all the beating and the abuse. What is inside there is bearings that are pressed in place. There's a bearing on each side of here, 
and this is a sleeve that goes in the middle. What typically winds up happening on these saws is that uh, I, I haven't been able to verify it with DeWalt yet, but the, the manufacturers lubricate these, these open needle bearings at their factory. Now they're selling needle bearings, they're not selling lubricant, <coughs> so you can imagine they're not going to use a whole lot. <laughs> so when they supply them to DeWalt, DeWalt's not highly interested in adding any more lubricant because they're interested in maximizing their profit on these saws. So they don't get real high quality lubricant in there. And what winds up happening is the lubricant uh, goes away. You know, it's, it's spent due to heat and, and dissipation. And the needle bearing ceases to turn. And the needle bearing then pounds against the uh, the shaft here, and you wind up beating an impression of the needle bearing into that into that shaft. So I went to uh, my local Harley shop where the the guy uh, there is, you know, much much like an engineer like myself, and he heartily recommended Valvoline synthetic grease, which is I've brought some of that tonight to show you. And I'll show you what that does. But uh, that is commonly used in uh, auto racing these days and also motorcycle racing to lubricate chain and, uh, and also turbochargers and um, superchargers. So I figure if it works for that, it ought to work for a scroll saw. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you can see you can see evidences here. So you can see some real good impressions here of a needle bearing that has sat in one place and just hammered on that uh, on that shaft. You and can actually see that better than you can feel it. When it's <coughs> on there, when it's clean, you can just barely feel any difference. But it's enough that once we put it out there, you can really tell the difference. When you get a bearing in that condition, and you get this thing. You know, fully assembled, you get a blade in there and tensioned, you turn that thing on and it is going to sound like a, a barrel of rocks rolling down a hill. Just that little bit of depression that's in there. So it's okay, here's another picture of that wedge that I talked about a moment ago where that thing sets. Here's the, the top of that uh, connecting shaft that goes to the front. There are bearings inside of here as well, and another sleeve that goes through that pair of bearings. Is that a needle bearing also uh, There's only one bearing in the whole machine, that being the one that attaches to that motor end of that connecting rod that is a sealed bearing. Everything else is open needle bearings. There's about, there's about 34 of them in there. Okay, this is your lower um, rocker assembly. Somebody was asking the question earlier about what that, you know, whether some of that stuff comes loose. What winds up happening is right in this area here is where that uh, linkage that goes to the, the bottom half of that rear rocker assembly, that linkage connects to here. This is the pivot where there's another pair of bearings, another, uh, another shaft that goes through there. Similarly here, I think there's only one, possibly one needle bearing in here. I don't remember right, right this minute. Another needle bearing and, and shaft inside here. Another, another one in here. Similarly on the top uh, rocker assembly. This is what this one looks like when it's disconnected from the machine. Again, the, the bolt that holds the, the linkage and the sleeve in place goes through here. Okay, there's a good picture of the bellows that I referred to earlier. That's the, this is a in view from inside with the, uh, some of the parts removed. 
there is uh, part of one of those arms for the uh, rocker assembly. And that arm moves up and down and causes the uh, bellows to compress and a little bit of air comes out of that port. Um, the, the, f the flapper is that mushroom looking apparatus on that, on that assembly that covers a hole in the top of that bellows. So that mushroom comes down over the hole for the, for the cycle. Then when the cycle completes, the mushroom comes off just slightly to ingest new air. Okay, this is the, the top plate. Uh, most of you are very familiar with that uh, uh, tensioner that's on your scroll saw that you, you pull on that thing up to, I think George usually racks his over around a eight or a nine. <laughs> Those of us that are more faint of heart will stop at about a five to get the, the right blade tension. Uh, but anyway, this is what is underneath that tensioner. There's a, uh, another linkage here that on about half the saws that I've taken apart, uh, people have uh, decided to dive into these things and do their own service. And they will frequently forget this part's there and they lose it and they try to compensate for it by uh, adjusting this rod and then the, the tension never completely stays there. So if you go diving into one of these things, you need to remember that that part's there and uh, needs to be there when you put it back together. These uh, four screws here will come loose. You can lift that plate up from the front, you know, pry it up a little bit with a screwdriver and it'll slide forward and that bellows is then exposed on the inside and that it'll look just like, just like the saw that I've got there on the table. Okay, another shot of the, uh, the wedge back there. Okay. This is uh, some pretty soft cast aluminum. Okay. <laughs> so on, on that last saw that I did for you, I, I'm highly suspicious that this thing has slid back and forth enough, possibly without enough grease on it, that it has worn there. So therefore you, you don't get enough lift on that arm yeah. to raise the blade up to take full Four advantage. Of the two yep. Okay, I primarily took that picture to show, you know, number one, that there's a circuit board there and to show you the, uh, the landing spots for a few of the wires. Uh, this is the power cord coming in from this direction. The white wire goes to that top lug there. Uh, then the black wire that goes into the cable assembly that goes down the arm, the upper arm, goes there. Uh, this assembly right here is pretty easy. All those wires stay together and it's a, got a one-way connector that goes there. I've got another shot over here where you get a, a better view of where a few of the other wires go, like the, the black wire goes to the switch. And so, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not to the switch. This is a fuse assembly. And the other side of the fuse assembly follows down and goes, goes down that cable assembly to the uh, upper arm. Yeah, he goes to the power switch, the red power switch that's up there right behind the speed adjustment, or right in front of it. Okay, with, uh, with one of those rockers completely apart and got it in your hand, uh, this is what the bearings look like. Uh, I, got, I got some raised eyebrows from a few folks that I talked about it, but you can see in this picture here, believe it or not, there is actually some printing on the side of these bearings. 
that was what I used to determine that um, what the size of these bearings are because it's a you know pretty much a standard numbering system that they come up with that you know certain numbers equate to a certain diameter and height of a bearing. I don't have the uh, these are open needle bearings. In other words, they are not sealed. Uh, you put a sleeve on the inside of the thing and all kinds of bad stuff can get in there like sawdust. So that's why they have this, this machine assembled the way they do. So it's clamshelled together with covers to try to keep the sawdust out. Although sawdust is not, you know, not terribly bad to get into a lubricant, it isn't going to isn't going to wear anything, but if you're cutting something other than wood, you know, like corian or some of these other materials on a, on a regular basis, you know, dust from there could, could get into these bearings and do some damage. Okay, I, uh, I used the... Do those needle bearings have a, a cage on the end, or are they loose? They are loose. Well, I, I, I take that back, Jerry. There is a cage that retains it, yeah. but it's it's internal to the bearing, yeah. and it's it's not it's not very hard to um, <coughs> disrupt that thing, and all of a sudden you got a whole handful of little needles. <laughs> well, I mean, I've dealt with needle bearing before. That's the only thing held the needle in place of the grease. That's that's so yeah. No you aren't you aren't far off in that condition here. <laughs> and I think also, did you say? Along with the size or that description to give you the size, it also told you who the manufacturer was. Yeah, the, uh, you can see clearly here, when I first looked at this, I saw the, I saw the letters I and A, and I thought maybe their mold might be uh, slightly defective, and the, the CH was no longer visible on the front end of it. I figured, well, bearings like this, they probably come from China. <laughs> uh, after doing a little bit of research on the thing, I found out INA is the manufacturer. It's a German company. So I first contacted them when I was trying to locate bearings. You, you could buy this, this entire assembly from DeWalt. Uh, that's what DeWalt recommends you do. When you, when you say, I've got, I've got a defective bearing in there, they say, well, you know, we'll sell you this whole part for $35. You know? This bearing here is $2. <laughs> So you can see why I was highly motivated to uh, find an alternative to do that. But at any rate, I, I first found these, uh, found that INA was, was uh, a German company and found their website and approached them on supplying me with bearings and I told them I was interested in about 30 and they said, do you mean, do you mean 30 truckloads? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, not that many. <laughs> So then I, then I started searching for these, these other numbers here and wound up stumbling across a, uh, an outfit out in California. It's called VXB. Uh, ironically, in this day and age, it's VXB.com. That they, uh, they will gladly supply these bearings to you for a very reasonable price. Uh, the smaller bearings are like $2 and the larger ones are $3. <laughs> and... Uh, I had difficulty finding that one sealed bearing, but I figured since it was sealed, it's not likely to need to be replaced as often as these things. So at any rate, I got, got on real good terms with these people. They're very responsive, very, uh, very accommodating. Okay, uh, neighbor of mine across the street, when I was talking with him about how to deal with this situation, I said, well, how do, you, how do you go about replacing bearings in an assembly like this? He said, oh, that, he said, that's pretty easy. You just stick one bearing on top of the other one and press it. And the, the old bearing comes out the bottom. I thought, well, that sounds easy enough. <laughs> when you've got a single bearing, that works well. When you've got a double race bearing like this one, it, you know, it's not as tricky, but, I mean, it's, it's not as is successful. So what I finally wound up doing with that is take a, uh, a real small punch, get a hold of the edge of the bearing, and then press this lower bearing out from the top, and then turn the part over and repeat the process. Press, press it out, 
and then press new ones in. And the way you accommodate that thing is you use a little small uh, arbor press like what I got up on there on the bench and you uh, apply a little bit of pressure to that thing. It'll resist at first but then you know as soon as it gets that that bearing moving it'll just press that thing right out and the old bearing pops out on the, onto the bench down below and you got a new bearing in place in the top. You just repeat that process down here and then from scratch you press in a, a new bearing in this location, a new bearing there and you have just rebearing that that entire uh, rocker assembly. Do that do that about uh, three more times and you've about repopulated most of your machine. Okay, when you go to reassemble those uh, rockers back into the, uh, the parts, sometimes this casting is a bit rough and you'll have trouble getting that part back in there. And what I found is taking a taking a fairly fine file and just creating a slight chamfer on this leading edge. Uh, it'll deburr that thing in such a way that you have no trouble at all just, you know, either putting it in by hand or, uh, or possibly using the, the press to coax it along a little bit. Okay, this is a front-on view of uh, both of these rockers reinstalled into that uh, the top assembly. There is a bolt that goes through this side that goes through that sleeve that holds that that bearing in place. Uh, there's another bolt here that holds the the bottom rocker in place and here you can see the end of the uh, connecting linkage. Okay, now then, another source of noise on these things is there's supposed to be a thrust washer on each side of this connecting link. Um, if those connecting washers, I mean those thrust washers aren't, aren't in there and aren't flanking the uh, that shaft that's in there, then uh, the bolt that goes through here winds up contacting the linkage directly and you will get quite a lot of racket out of that. This is the lower rocker assembly which is, as a matter of fact, these, these two castings here are identical to the upper rockers. Uh, a lot of people will try to give you the argument that um, that there's no way that the blade can remain parallel on there. When, when I looked at these things and I see the same casting marks on the side, including the casting number, here and here is the same as the ones on the top. The part number on this linkage is identical. Uh, there's not much of a way that you can get anything other than parallel movement out here at this point. <laughs> You'd have to really go out of your way to, to do otherwise. There's two bearings inside here that I replaced. Uh, this sleeve is, is very oftentimes one that gets beat up badly. Uh, also this, this sleeve and bearing that is inside here also frequently gets beat up and the bearings here and here, uh, the sleeves that are in there frequently get beat up. Now if the sleeve is beat up, it's because the, the bearing has dried out, it's quit rotating, and I don't trust those needles, even though, you know, you may be tempted to just replace the sleeve and, and try it again. And granted, the, uh, the needles would be harder material than the than the sleeve, but while you're in there, the uh, the bearing is two bucks. Uh, for this one, it's three bucks for these two down here, 
you know, while you got the saw torn this far apart, is you know, saving of about twelve dollars going to be worth it? <laughs> uh, the bearing that is behind this nut here is the only sealed bearing in the whole machine. Another important point to note here: if uh, I don't know how many of you are uh, much into mechanics, but there is a very, very subtle hint that you've got here that this is a left-hand thread nut. And believe you me, you can strip that thing out, you can snap that shaft off, I've done both. Because that, that shaft there is not, uh, not terribly good. Here you can see the eccentric that's in there. That's, that's that little counterweight that uh, keeps the machine running smoothly. It's attached to the motor shaft, yes. As a matter of fact, the motor shaft has a flat on it so that when you get that counterweight on there, there's a set screw that goes against, in, against and in, into that flat. So it's pretty hard to go wrong. Okay, there's, a, there's another shot of one of these, a different one of these uh, sleeves that's been beat up by dry bearing. Show you this is one of these uh, one of these saws in action. So, so you can see a pretty good close up there of uh, the various mechanisms while it's working. Looks like my camera work was not too steady there. It's not got a real good. Uh, Resolution on. Help in there. Oh yeah, yeah. We've we've frequently got able-bodied help in there. <laughs> okay, this is the uh, this is the contraption that I came up with here for uh, lubricating these bearings. It's just a conventional grease gun, and Napa sells a. Uh, a hypodermic needle looking affair that will snap into the uh, the fitting on the grease gun where you can you can get right up right up close to one of those needle bearings with that so you you could probably get by with not having to take the saw apart any further than <coughs> than what I've got it here uh, maybe back a uh, back a screw out and uh, slide the sleeve out and you could definitely get to any part of the, the bearing then without even pressing the bearing out. One of the uh, benefits that I was looking for and finally found it with this, um, this Valvoline synthetic is it, it will actually migrate into the wearing surfaces. It actually seeks heat and moves toward it. I'm anticipating that most of you have got scroll saws that have never been apart to the stage before. I've never seen any lubricant other than what came in it from the factory. If you lube one of these things well one time, you probably wouldn't have to touch it again for another three years if you use this type of lube. So just demonstrate on there where, where you would lube it on those. You know, five yeah. There's two bearings inside here. So Actually, when you when you take the case apart, yeah, yeah. When you take the case apart, this is one of the screws that has to come out. Uh, as soon as that screw comes out, the sleeve that's behind here is loose. You can pull that out in your hand. So you've got both of those bearings right there in front of you, and. You can also check the condition of that sleeve at that point. If that thing is, has telltale signs of what I showed you up there, uh, you know you've got to break it down further and start replacing a few parts in there. But if, if it's... If you don't notice, Bob, to make it work, he stuck a socket. Yeah. He socket on there. I mean, it's, that's not in the machine. As a matter of fact, we've all seen. So it's true as long enough so it would hold it in place 
while he was showing us how it worked. See, that's a socket. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you didn't see that, I didn't. See, that's what was Knock that screw out. I got it from Napa. And it says Valley, yep. There's a whole host of oils out there. When you put in the instructions on this thing, can you put the amount of oil and stuff you put in those things in that instruction thing too? Um, so when you're looking at the thing, you'll know what you're putting in there, like what he said to put in there, instead of just Tom, Dick, and Harry going out there and buying something from Auto. Somebody put in there. Yeah, the from it. Well, it's it's inside that sleeve. If I oh, okay. yeah, if I if I take that if I take that tube apart, we're going to have grease everywhere. Oh, no, no, I'm, not <laughs> saying, I'm not saying oh. taking that apart. Yeah. I'm saying tell what you've got in there to put in there. In other the words, don't go to AutoZone and somebody and buy just any oil. It was Valvoline. Yeah, it's it's Valvoline. Valvoline. Um, well, I it doubt. Says, does that be in your instructions? Mm, yes, because it'll be in by voice. It's on by voice. Okay. All right. We got yeah. it. He's got the yeah. Language. Yeah. We got it. Then. Yeah. yeah. But what is that you're holding in your hand? Uh, this is a sleeve that goes in there. I'll pass. I'll pass this around. How viscous is that stuff? Do you have trouble squirting it through that little needle? No. Mm -mm. It's a little stiffer than what I thought. Yeah. It's. Uh, uh, this pump. This right here is a bad saw. This is yes. My, this is my saw he already fixed. It. No, not this one. This is my second saw he's fixing. So that's the place he's talking about. Yes. Yeah. This is brand new. This is not the one that's in the picture. The one that's in the picture we'll talk about in a little bit. Watch where you step. That thing is leaking again. <laughs> yeah. See, all of mine, just, that's where they were. Because that's the first place they wear. Hmm. Almost all the wear we found, all the worst part, was all on the back side of the machine, and you know, not hardly any on the front part. Well, that's where most of the load is. I'd recommend you not get any of that stuff on you. It it will creep everywhere. <laughs> Your wife will wonder what you have, have you been into. <laughs> yes. You know we can shut that heat source off. <laughs> Hit it again. Does it have a part there you go. With it? No, it's um, if you get over to uh, someplace like Napa, uh, Valvoline will have a, a set of uh, greases. There'll probably be ten or twelve choices there. There will only be one of them that is synthetic. And I have not found this at any of the other. You know, like discount auto parts and AutoZone or none of them. No, have AutoZone didn't have it. Bunch, we went to a bunch of them. I couldn't find boys, it. Right. Yep. I've gotten I've gotten some of it from there. I've gotten some of it from the store in Lilburn. Napa's the only one that seemed to have the Valvoline, Valvoline yep. synthetic. Yeah, the. Uh, the same oil that you would grease a fitting like a bulldozer track. Yeah. 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 You could. Mm -hmm. Do they sell that in for the small guns? Because mm -hmm. if you don't have the big gun to put it in, Bob. Um, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't. Did. I haven't seen it in any other form factor okay. other than the big one. You got to have the big gun to do it. Yeah. Canister. It's yeah. Canister it's insert. right. Yeah, now Napa sold me that uh, grease gun because I had I had gotten rid of all of my grease guns because I got tired of them leaking all over the place. <laughs> That's right. But uh, I think they sold me that one for like twelve or fifteen dollars, and the the uh, syringe or fitting on the end of it. And there was the needle that goes in the end of it. I think it was another five or six dollars. So I was I was in business to 
lubricate more uh, more bearings than I knew what to do with. Uh, about about half of what I passed around on that ticket. So one little bitty squeeze. On yes, that thing exactly. Bad. Yeah, you don't want to don't want to do too much. It it well the danger that you run into if you put too much in there is it's going to start well no it'll it'll start slinging it all over the place and it makes a real good sawdust collector. <laughs> Saw this all over yep. Inside your Yep. So I put uh, I put about half of what's what's in there. I've got a new one, but this is just temporary. I, I'm going to replace those bearings. Dang, that thing's dripping all over the floor. What I do is use a chenille or pipe cleaner to uh, move the grease around to coat the needle bearings. So if you've got a saw that's never been lubed, uh, this is a real good start, starting point here, because this, this one is the one that takes the most abuse. But I just uh, swirl the grease around, then you take that, that sleeve, press it back in place, and you're about good to go on that one. Now then, to get to these others, like the ones uh, behind here, and here and here, this is considerably more difficult. It involves um, taking this motor bolt loose. And remember I told you that it is a left-hand thread. So you need to find the... Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I was checking the. Say again. Nope. Nope. Uh, what it, what you're seeing on the end of the shaft there, is uh, where it's peened over to keep that nut from backing out. Now, uh, Dewalt apparently is fond of uh, a belt and suspenders at this stage because it, this is already a locking nut. So it's got a, a uh, you know, anti-vibration assembly to the nut. And in addition to that, what they've done is they've peened the shaft, peened the end of the uh, threads over to keep that thing from backing out. So you have trouble getting it off then? No, they haven't, they haven't damaged it that badly. Sounds like they did a pretty good job. This one feels about the worst of any that we've done so far. So you know where you actually feel the damage. If you put, use your fingers, you won't feel. If you take your fingernail, yeah. <coughs> feel on it, I can feel every ridge from each one of the little spines in there. And this particular Wait. saw has probably got the least amount of hours on it of, of my two saws. Is this Mom, one? if you have never worked on one of these things, you. <laughs> You recommend anybody that's never done this to better keep your hands off of it? Well, well it, 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 yeah. I will tell you when he's at the house one time, he saw three wires. We had three of them taken apart. Go buy a new one. At first, he took the first one you see on the screen. That was my original saw, which he took apart, and he had to take, he took this my second one semi apart so he could put that one back together because <laughs> he had extra parts on the table. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing I'm grabbing hold of that counterweight with these uh, vice grips so that that shaft will keep from turning while I loosen this bolt or this nut rather, it's and it's left hand thread so you want to put the put the ratchet on tighten. We did throw one of these motors away because you tried to go right handed. I forgot when I dove into one of these things that that thing was left hand thread and I, uh, I learned how brittle those shafts were. And the shaft isn't all that thick at that point too. And I assume that's not replaceable. 
Yeah. Nope. Well, it was. Well, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I took the motor apart to see if you could change out the shaft, and it's one solid. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is what you have to do to get to start disassembling the rest of the machine. You got to take that apart so that you can get this arm off and uh, get this whole linkage going. So what I'd recommend at this point is that we get up here and take these, these assemblies off here and here and release the uh, uh, connecting linkage so that we've got uh, fewer parts to deal with and uh, fewer things to fall all over the bench here. Now, what I would uh, heartily recommend is that when you're, when you're working on an assembly like this, use, use good assembly practices. Ah, it's down on the floor. <laughs> but uh, any parts that you take off, put them in a, in a container so if something falls off and starts strewing parts across the floor, at least all you're looking for is tools instead of parts. <laughs>
they're depending on that to hold that, that thing in place. And specifically, that is blue Loctite. There's about four different versions of it. Uh, but based on the size of the fastener and the fineness of the threads, the blue is what's recommended for that. Again, this is another product that I got at Napa. The red is normally used to, to lock down uh, studs in an engine, and even heat won't bother that. Some of these blade clamps, um, I know on, on my saw at home, the, the, the dead end of the screw, in other words, every, everybody's used to adjusting this, uh, this blade clamp with the, uh, the lever on it. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the dead end of the screw, uh, in other words, the, the anvil or the stop that this uh, goes blade clamp goes into, you know, tightens against, that screw is capable of backing out. It will actually come loose. I'd recommend uh, if, if, you know, if you start experiencing that, if things start moving in there a little bit, back that screw all the way up, put a little Loctite on it, put it back in, let it dry for a day, and it'll, uh, it'll be fine. But you might want to make note of where, where that thing is. Look, look through the front and make sure you get that thing back in the same place. No, it'll go all the way through. <laughs> Another, another thing that I learned about these things a number of years ago is when you take this, this tensioner knob all the way out, you think you've got a nice, you know, simple screw part in here. This, this part on the end is actually loose. It rotates. I'd recommend you put a drop of gun oil or something like that inside there because this thing is supposed to move. When the blade goes up and down, you're going to get a slight amount of movement out of that. Otherwise, you're going to be tensioning or torquing your blade. Mm 